Hi there, my name is Jersey Drozd. I'm a cartoonist and teaching artist, and today I'm going to be painting this drawing I did of Cringer and Orko from the Masters of the Universe cartoon. And then if I, if I have time, if I get that done in less than an hour, I'm going to move on to inking this drawing of Stratos, also from the Masters of the Universe cartoon. We're going to get started right now. Okay. Why Masters of the Universe? Well, why not? But, no. This is continuing my series of um, cute, brave characters, which I've been doing for some time now. Um, but also, the new He-Man television show comes out on Netflix this Friday, and um, I'm cautiously excited about it. Uh, let me switch to my paints. that there and let's let's work with these paints today this is a, a set another set that I have and there's lots of space for mixing uh, you'll see that I also have masking fluid over top of cringers uh, what would you call it stripes <laughs> what would you call it <laughs> oh man I gotta wake up um, cause yeah, I'm, I'm going to try to do a little bit of a nicer job getting the orange stripes on them. Let's get a little bit of, you'll notice also that the, the background is different behind me. Um, out of my outlook. So I don't want any more notifications, please. Thank you. Okay. Uh, my background's different today because yeah, I and and the foreground is different, right? Because you're not seeing that like wood pa that uh, sort of wood block background anymore underneath the characters. Um, yeah, I, I I brought my drawing desk, my drafting table down to the streaming studio. And this is the drafting table I've had since I was 14 years old, so it's quite old now. A little beat up, a little, little worse for wear. Um, when I had it as a teenager, I thought, wow, it's not going to be my desk forever. <laughs> so I didn't treat it very well when I was a kid. And I should have realized, it was, I probably, you know, you could have a desk like that for a long time. Eventually, I'm going to get a really nice desk. Well, I didn't. I like this desk. It's fine. It does, it does what it needs to do. And now it's like loaded with sentimental value because, uh, blue in there. A little darker. Is that, that that cringer green? Yeah, I'm looking at Battle Cat right across the way. Yeah, sure. Okay, so now next step. We're going to start putting some color on this in a second. Yeah, now the desk is the desk I'm drawing on, the one I had since I was 14, is loaded with a whole bunch of sentimental value in that I, I started out in comics working on this desk. I drew a lot of my earliest work on this desk. Cringer nice and wet. And lay down that green. So I know it's come up in some other uh, live streams I've done, but you know, that new He-Man show, that's why I'm doing this painting today. It's because it's the new He-Man show on Netflix this Friday, is it July 23rd. And I have spent a lot of time talking about and celebrating my love of these characters through live streams where I'm drawing them or talking about them on my podcast. I do a, a lesson in my comics uh, 
my youth and teen comics classes where we watch an episode of Masters of the Universe, Masters of the Universe, and then redesign three of the characters. Um, so, so you know, I get every once in a while somebody reaches out to me and says like, "Well, what do you think of the the new show?" I'm like, "Well, I haven't seen it yet, but I, from what I've seen in the in the previews, I haven't seen anything that like makes me say harumph yet." It looks like kids could watch it. That's important to me. And I didn't see He-Man uses power to hurt anybody, like specifically like punch Merman in the face or anything like that. So that makes me happy. So we'll see. I did not have Netflix and I re-signed up for it because of it, so. I'm willing to give it a shot. Now, people have asked in the past, like, well, what do you do about your paper buckling when you're working, like, kind of big and with this wet of a, of a brush? And, like, the truth is I just let the paper get a little bit warped. Um, I carry with me in my in my shoulder bag, my EDC, every, everyday carry, um, I actually carry a little block of, um, what would you say, what would you call it? It's watercolor paper, but it's a specific size, postcard size watercolor paper. So in case I ever want to do like a quick little painting and mail it to somebody. Um, and that is on a block, which is to say it's like a stack of paper that's glued around the edges. So it holds it in place when you're painting. So like the buckling isn't quite as much of an issue. This Canson watercolor paper, though, is not bad. It, it holds up pretty good. It's not, it doesn't warp too much. Although I'm not laying down like gigantic puddles of color either. So, yeah, instead of seeing a bunch of He-Man figures behind me like you normally would, you're seeing a blank wall because this is the part of the studio that I have not finished yet. Like, finished finished in the sense of decorating, setting, putting stuff on the walls. So expect that to change behind me. Okay, now we need a lighter green for his muzzle. Whoop, 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 let's get that nose in there. Okay, now, while that dries, blend some of that green. You know what, it's okay if I get his little beans green, because I'm going to put gray on him anyway. That'll be all right. Okay. <clears throat> How about we do Warco now? Lost my cap for my brush. That's okay. <clears throat> I'm going to turn it upside down so I can paint Orko without messing up my Battle Cat paint. And thankfully, I already have some red mixed over here. Probably from the last time I painted Orko because it wasn't that long ago. And these paintings, by the way, are always available in my Etsy shop, Tiny Astronaut on Etsy. I have a URL that points right at it. It's just tinyastronaut.com. 
Why tiny astronaut jersey? Well, it's the store that me and my wife both put art in. What are you? A little bit of something I don't want in there. The Netflix series, I mean, it looks like it's going to have really high production values. So I think uh, if you haven't paid any attention to it in some time, it'll be a good time to check it out. Um, because I can tell you, the Filmation Show, now, I want to make it very clear. I love the Filmation Show. By the way, hi. It's Anamkara. It's Anamkara. Hello. Thank you for being here. Um, I love the Filmation Show a lot. But when I do my He-Man redesign class and make and you know instruct the children to watch an episode of the show, invariably one of them will say, "Why aren't they moving?" <laughs> the animation is not awesome. It's not. It's really not. And you know, uh, that's there's a lot of reasons for it. Uh, actually, I think they're good reasons. Lou Scheimer, the uh, the head of filmation, really wanted to keep the animation in the United States. And so they had to cut a lot of corners in order to make it possible to keep the animation here. And so you get a lot of a lot of that weird repeated animation when He-Man leans back and laughs and somebody turned into that meme video of Prince Adam singing that share song. Um, get a lot of like rotoscoped footage of He-Man jumping over a log like twice in an episode sometimes. They, used, they had a stock system that they used in order to like make it affordable. So, as a result, the animation does not, as they say, hold up. It's 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 tough. It's not it's not it's not Pinocchio. So, this new show looks like it has like really high quality animation. So we'll see. I I have a feeling that that's going to help sell a lot, even if it has some shortcomings. And the writing is going to be. Um, at least really good to look at. But what I've always loved about it, like what made the, the, the property work for me is that the, the main character, the main hero, I should say, He-Man, uh, is the most powerful man in the universe. And they always, in the Filmation show at least, they always played it that, well, that means he has to be the most gentle man in the universe. So you never see him use his power to harm another living thing. Like, there's even an episode where he has to cut down a tree in order to save man at arm's life, and he won't do it. Um, which I know, that's not for everybody. I totally get that. Because, that, like, I, I was in the room when Kevin Smith announced that he was doing the new He-Man show, and the language, as I remember it, he said something about, um, we're finally going to have all of the action and violence that you were denied as children. And like all of the people in the room stood up and cheered. And I was like, okay, well, that's not what I come to it for. But, you know, there's a lot of people who like this property. And I'm not the only one who gets to see what it is. So... But yeah, if 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 on the new show He Man like actually like you know uses his amazing power to like punch people in the face like Merman and Trap John whatever, even though they are really powerful, um, he's the most powerful in the universe, which means he has to use restraint by my reckoning. Which means that all I'm saying is is that I will probably find it difficult to watch if that happens. But if everybody else enjoys it, everybody else enjoys it. That's awesome. But I, I was surprised that in some of the trailers... Oh, actually, maybe I shouldn't talk about the trailers because some people might not want anything spoiled for them. But there were some things that I saw in the trailers that made me go like, oh, okay, maybe this will be all right. Yeah, the... Yes. It's interesting to see how they're... 
adapting the old designs for a new aesthetic, but still really keeping to the original designs in a lot, in a lot of ways. Um, unlike the 2002 version where they really did a lot of updating to the character designs. And I like the 2002 version too, although that one as well was like, it's a little fighty. <laughs> Um, but they, they like really, they did a good job of hearkening to the original designs, but they really took it in a different direction. Whereas this new show, it, it looks and feels like they're kind of really honoring the original design a lot more. That, oh, there. I might have to put some background color behind Orko to blend that red in a little bit. Okay, let's see if I got some yellow for Orko's eyes. And then go back to working on Cringer while Orko dries. All right. Maybe we'll do that blanket next. We a big brush for that. And I'm just going to go with a just a dark red. Why? For contrast. get the by the way when i said i was in the room when kevin smith announced the what's it about the he-man uh i was at a convention i was not in a room with kevin smith because i know kevin smith i was at i was at PowerCon 2019 which is the annual he-man convention in anaheim california and it looks like i'm going this year too now that things are opening back up and you know, providing nothing bad happens with uh, the coronavirus variants. Look, I'm going to be at PowerCon 2021. Just for fun. I'm not tabling or doing any, like, official business as a cartoonist or teaching artist. Going to hang out with other He-Man fans. And sitting on some panels, listening to some old artists talk about the stuff. One of my favorite memories from 2019 was Errol McCarthy, who illustrated a lot of the card backs of the toys, was there. And uh, I got to actually chat with him a little bit about drawing technique and we're talking about brush pens. And, and it, it went from, it went very, very quickly from fan gushing over, you know, artists' work to two artists just like geeking out about what different tools they like to use and why that was amazing so that's why i like to go meet the people who are involved in making this stuff and just basically tell them that their stuff is is meant a lot to me all right let's do cringer shading now or should I do Orco shade? I think I should do Orco shading because I gotta wait for this rug underneath Cringer to dry. And how long have I been going? 20 minutes? Yeah. 17 minutes. Okay, so now we're gonna mix Orco's shading. Switch my palettes here real quick. And we'll get some of this red. this in the shot so you can see what I'm mixing. That's the whole reason I have this second camera here for crying out loud. It's too big a palette. And then we want a little bit of purple.
Is it hard to use watercolors? It took a little practice. Um, I actually took a class on this at a community art center, and actually at the art center where I used to work in Ann Arbor, at the Ann Arbor Art Center. Um, and uh, I think I think I could sum up my personal difficulty. It, it, I guess it depends on what kind of artist you are. So, like, I historically for me, like my background in comics art has always been really about like establishing a lot of control. Um, as a matter of fact, I was really nervous about taking on inking. Um, I used to be, I used to only pencil and I'd hand off inking to somebody else because I was so nervous about what if the ink pen goes wrong? That's permanent. It's hard to fix, right? Penciling used to race. Um, and I felt the same way about watercolors. Like they feel a little bit wild and uncontrollable. And then I was at an event called um, the Ann Arbor Comic Arts Festival with my buddy Ben Hatke of Z of the Space Girl, Mighty Jack. Um, and he had illustrated a book entirely in watercolor, uh, Nobody Likes a Goblin. And I remember asking him the very same question, like, why watercolor? And he said something to the effect of, like, it's fun to sort of chase it and, like, let it do what it wants to do and then try to catch up to it. So it's, there's, like, a little bit of a degree of, like, the watercolor is going to do what it wants to do, and you have to sort of, like, work with it that way. And I remember when Ben said that, I thought, no way, not me. I'm never going to do it. That sounds too dangerous. I'm the artist. I'm in control of the work. And then I, then I took this class, and um, I found out that it's actually kind of fun to like do that on-the-fly on the improvisation with the, with the watercolors. Like it, like right there in Orko's armpit. I don't know if you can see, but it. Let's see if it focuses. It bled a little bit there, right? So now I got to figure out what do I what am I going to do about that? Am I going to try to water that out? Meaning, take a little, let that dry, take a little bit of water right here, and then dab it with my cloth. Or am I going to try to put another color behind them to try to work with it? I don't know. So I find it fun now. I, I actually really enjoy using watercolor. I find it very relaxing and meditative. At the same time, it's like a little bit invigorating because I'm like chasing or racing against the paint, trying to figure out what it wants to do and how I can like sort of like curb it to what I what I hope it'll do. But also it provides you with those things that like I think it was Bob Ross called happy accidents. There's another thing that I've noticed, and I don't know, do you... I, uh, it's Anna, it's Anna M. Cara, if I'm saying that right. Do you work digitally or do you work on paper? Or do you both? And there's a reason I'm asking. Get in here and try to see a little bit better what I'm doing. I think that's a way of putting it. Watercolor is like, I wouldn't say it's totally unexpected. I mean, I, there, there's a plan to what I'm doing here, but I'm also like, you know, planning ahead and working with what I think the watercolor is going to do. Um, but I just noticed that the reason I asked about if you work digitally is that I find that digital gives you so much control. It really lends you such an unprecedented amount of precision in the illustration. And I got very hooked on that. When my first comics that I did in Clip Studio Paint, which is the illustration app I mostly use when I'm drawing comics, um, I would put each figure in their own folder grouping on their own layers, and then I would render the entire background, like an animation background. And so I would always have the option to move things just, just so. Like, oh, there's a tangent there. I'll just nudge that over just so. But it made the work take, you know... I, it, it almost doubled the time it took to do the work because I was adding so much complexity to it. Whereas working on paper, it feels like there's this, you sort of live with things, right? Like, like there's little mistakes that have already happened on here. I'm like, ah, eh, you know, 
I can't spend all day on this. The cost is so high for making for fixing mistakes that I just don't do it as much. Well, as far as being scared of watercolors, and believe me, I get you. I get you. And, and I'll tell you a story about my first watercolor class. And I love telling this story because it really like highlights this idea of getting in and over your head and getting into like learner's mindset again. Um, when I took my watercolor class, like I said, it was at the art center where I worked and I had been teaching for like a decade. And my classes, my comics classes were pretty well known. And the, the, the art center actually even hired me once to teach the other teachers how I teach. Okay. And I sit down for this watercolor class and I'm really excited because I'm like, I'm going to get into learner's mindset. I'm going to get to like really get in over my head and like operate under the guidance of a teacher. And like and the thing about when you're learning something new, you improve so fast because going from zero to even 20% knowledge is such a gigantic leap compared to say like when you have like a level of mastery and then your, your improvement is much more incremental. So I was looking forward to all of that. And then the instructor comes to the class. She recognizes me. She knows me. We've been working together for a long time. She's like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you're taking my class. That's so cool. She's like, I'm so, I'm so flattered and honored that you're taking my class. And I'm like, hey, hey, don't play it up because I want to get into learner mindset and I know I'm going to suck at this. And then sure enough, I did my first lesson and I got lost in the weeds. It was a complete catastrophe. It was a mess on the paper. And the teacher comes over. And this is after saying all those nice things about me earlier. And she says, uh, you tried. <laughs> but that's the point. That's the point of getting in over your head and getting lost. And it's frustrating. And it sucks sometimes because like you just want to get in there and you know what you want. You got a picture in your head of what you want to do. But part of the deal is, like I said, being in over your head and that's, let's see. Get this mixed. There we go. You can see what I'm mixing now. But it's it's tough. It's tough and it's really challenging and difficult to to get out of that urgency sort of headspace. Because like when I want to learn something, I want to learn it now. I want I want to I want to master this, especially when you have like some mastery in some other areas. Like if you're kind of good at some other kinds of drawing. And then, like, you see how bad you are at this new thing. Oh, my gosh, that's frustrating. Yeah, if you don't mess up, you don't learn anything. That's absolutely right. That's, like, one of the rules of my comics class is, like, you know, it's awesome to not know things. That means you're going to learn things. This would be an awfully boring line of work if we were just awesome at it all the time. If you put a game in your uh, Switch and it just popped up and said, guess what? You won. You wouldn't play it ever again. Um counterintuitive but the being in over your head just the right amount is like what makes games fun and so i think about that and i try to remind myself of that when i'm getting frustrated and getting into that like urgency headspace of like i gotta learn this now well i'll probably just enjoy this a little bit and trust because here's the other thing like if you have if you are good at any other kinds of drawing you already have evidence that you can do this learning me i mean so yeah watercolor is tricky but like i said i i and i really honestly never thought i would be into it um i spent two decades of my exploration as an artist talking myself out of doing any kind of like paint so now i'm a cartoonist as a different kind of artist i work with lines and occasionally i work with digital color but i do not work with paint Real artists work with paint. I don't. Boy, listen to that. I was really doing some arguing for my limitations. Anyway, um, I've been doing watercolor now pretty regularly for, I want to say, three years. And I'm still not, I don't consider myself that awesome at it yet. I'm, it's still not doing everything I want. And I'm still not great at like picking the exact color I want. But I'm having fun. All right, let's do Cringer's nose. Do 
get some of this indigo and mix it in with my green because I want a really dark green. Yeah, just tons of practice. It's like anything, right? It just get yourself some watercolor paper. If you're used to working on smooth paper, you get hot press water paper it has a very smooth texture. Cold press um, has a little bit of a texture to it. So you can see how like my ink lines have kind of like a roughness to them because of the texture of the paper. And it's, you can think of it just like an iron, like the hotter the iron, the smoother the, the press, right? So hot press would be smooth paper, uh, smooth paper, cold press would be a little bit bumpier paper. And that's another thing that I didn't think I was gonna like at first is like the roughness of the paper. I was so into like really clean, precise lines. Like if you look at, there's a comic I did years ago called The Front Rebirth, which I inked on Bristol board just with crow quills. And um, and yeah, it's, it's really crisp. The art is super crisp. That, that version of me would be recoiling in horror at this image right now. Lines off of Cringer's muzzle. <laughs> All right. I'll also say that, like, it's just, it feels really fun to work on paper. I forget that sometimes when I'm working digitally is like, there's something about the experience of of feeling the brush on the paper that other kinds of, or digital illustration doesn't give me. Right now, I'm totally guessing. I'm just throwing down some like light green on here just to like give it like a little bit more warmth in some areas. I might be totally messing this up. And I guess like if I had one last thing to say about this whole idea of like lots of practice is like something that my students often ask or like when I'm doing school visits and the question inevitably comes up, a student will, or a kid will ask like, well, how long does it take to make a comics page? And I'll tell them, I'll say like, well, anywhere between, uh, you know, six to 25 hours, depending on the page. And the kids always gasp like, oh my gosh, that's so long. And it is. And then I say, well, but just think about that. That's, that's six to nine hours. I get to think about comics and think about drawing. It's a long time, but it's also a long time I get to spend doing art. And that's not nothing. Okay, how are we doing on time? 33 minutes. Okay, I got to get moving on this. Okay. What I might do now while this dries, because I don't want to peel off that um, this masking fluid until the paint around it is dry. So I'm going to do some shading on the on the rug, do Cringer's eyes, and then I'm going to peel the stripes off and paint the stripes orange. So let's get the first get our yellow for Cringer's eyes. my tiny one you're very wet too need a little bit of dry brush so I can go in here and I'm gonna have to touch up that nose a little bit more before I finish
Do I need to put a little bit more shading on Cringer's underside? further. Now I'm going to switch sides to my reds. I'm going to set you aside for a second. I think I want to also put just the tiniest bit of shading underneath Cringer's muzzle there. A little bit of this light green. Is there anything left to do? I guess what I can do now, well, I think that's still too wet. Just gonna put some background color around them. And for that, I think what I'm gonna do is a lot of orange. This is a trick I learned in my watercolor class. So I'm going to take just a wet brush with no no paint on it. You know, I'm going to like take a sheet of paper. Uh, there's only like the tiniest bit of yellow is left in it from when I was mixing my yellows. But I'm just very quickly just scumble around and just put like a little bit of water on the paper just to get it ready to receive some paint. And this is when you want to do some large blocks of area. And then when I drop my color in, it's just going to spread, hopefully. You aside for a second. And you can see in the glare of the light some of the, some of the water as I lay it down. Yeah, I mean, it, roughly, the idea is that the paint will spread a little bit more evenly. I'm not always super successful at it, but we'll see. You see the paint just spreads a little faster, and I can move it around and sort of, like, smoosh it into places. And you don't see the paint strokes as much. But that said, I'm still not trying to do it 
absolutely perfectly. There we go. So we're in the home stretch now. Got to get the stripes off of Cringer. And I've been sort of dragging my feet on it because I tried this recently with a painting of Kermit the Frog that's in my feed, in my YouTube channel. And uh, it told, the masking fluid tore the paper. For those who don't know, this is what I'm talking about. It's called drawing gum and it is a rubber a liquid rubber that you can apply to areas that you don't want the paint to get through and then i can just paint right over top of cringer without having to worry about the stripes and then when the time comes you come in and very gently run your finger over it and you can see how it's starting to peel up from the paper right there and now i can go in there with my orange and paint my orange stripes if i'm careful if I tear the paper, that could be bad. This is a little bit of a tedious part. Might not be as much fun to watch, but or maybe it'll be very satisfying to watch. I don't know. Get these little bits of gross rubber on your hands. So I'm almost done getting this part off. There's actually a tool you can use for this too. You don't have to use your finger. Let's see. Now you get these white spots where the stripes go. It does make it easier to do fine detail stuff. Or if you want to, like, for instance, let's say I wanted to paint that background with one big brush. I could have used the masking fluid on all of them, then done the wash in the background and then rub off all the masking fluid put on a new layer for his stripes. I mean, that's how some artists do it. As far as I understand, that's how, that's how some artists do it. I don't talk with a ton of people about watercolor, sadly. I wish I did. It's one of the things that I hope as we go back into the world again, if we can, uh, one of my first orders of business is going to be like hanging out with artists and drawing together so we can talk about this stuff. Yeah, that's a little, a little wet over here. So I'm, yeah. See, the reason I don't want to do it when it's wet is because I'm running my finger over the paint and I'm actually getting picking up some of the paint with my finger. Go to a drier area. Thank you. I'm I'm glad. I'm yeah. I was hoping that it would work with using the warm colors behind Cringer to make the cool colors on him pop more, make you see the shape more. These are two of my favorite characters from the cartoon, from the Filmation cartoon. And I actually, I have a talk that I did. Um, I don't know if it exists on YouTube, but I did it at a couple of events years ago, basically talking about like what the, the myth, the, the structure of He-Man and the Masters of the Universe means to me personally. And w one of the reasons Cringer is my favorite character, one of my favorite characters, I should say, is that he doesn't want to be Battle Cat. He kind of hates being that aggressive. Battle Cat likes being Battle Cat, but Cringer does not. You know, when He-Man points the sword at him, um, Cringer shudders. 
like, don't do that to me. I hate this part. They, they make a lot of jokes in the show about that. Ah, I think I ripped the paper. I think I ripped the paper. Yep, I did. I'm going to have to try to work with this. Let's see if I can get uh, something sharp to get that out. Yeah, it would be cool at the at the He-Man convention if I could meet like another artist there to like get worked up over watercolors with. That'd be fun. But what I like about Cringer being afraid of being Battle Cat is it points to this idea that, you know what? It's like it's like trying to convince a child like why wouldn't you want to be the most powerful person in the room? Yeah. Of course I would. But Cringer's there to say, like, well, maybe that's not the best thing in the world. Maybe it kind of sucks to be that on. Maybe wanting to nap and have a good meal is good, too. And they play it for humor in the Filmation show, but I think there's something that's philosophically correct about that. It's like, let's not forget, you know, Bilbo Baggins, Adventures Make One Late for Dinner. I think that rip's going to be okay when I get the orange paint on it. I like that Cringer points at that, the reluctant hero, because I think we need to see reluctant heroes too, because um, it, it can get easy when you get into these like power fantasy stories to like get swept up in this idea that being strong and being able to overcome people with brute force is always a good thing. In Orko 2, another reason I like him so much is in his dimension, on the planet Trala, he's like the most famous, most powerful sorcerer of all. He's Orko the Great. So once again, it's like, well, why don't you just go home then? Just be famous and powerful and everybody loves you. He says, well, my friends need me here. And I'm going to operate at less capacity and be less powerful because this is where I feel like I'm, I'm most needed right now. And it's okay to not be the most powerful person in the room. I love that idea. Yeah, see, I spread some of that yellow paint into Cringer's face there by accident. Let's see if I can... That'll be okay. Because I'm going to make these stripes orange anyway. See, when I was in watercolor class too, and this is another thing if you decide that to play with watercolors, something we had as a tool in the room was a hair dryer. And we would actually like, once we lay down like a background coat, like that background, we go with the hair dryer, wow, wow, wow. Now it's dry we go back to painting, sped things up, especially when you only have like an hour and a half to do a painting in class. Talking of which, how much time I got? I got like 12 minutes. Okay. Oh, ripped the crinchers. Talk us a little bit. that too this is last part's not gonna take very long okay there's our stripes all marked out from where the masking fluid was. I get the last of it off. Get that paper off. I can fix that, no problem, I think. All right. Orange, where are you, my friend? I need some orange paint.
brush is too wet. Get out real quick a little bit. painting turns out okay i will put it in my etsy store with all my other live stream paintings once again the address is it's just at on etsy just do a search for tiny astronaut or tinyastronaut.com will get you there and i do these live streams tuesdays at 1 30 eastern 12 30 central 10.30 Pacific. And it's just my name, Jersey Droz, on Twitch and on YouTube. The other social stuff is below me, right? Well, actually, rss.jdros.com is the is it's an RSS feed of everything that I make. Whenever I make something like this, it's it posted there. Get out of there! I got a little piece of that rubber. See, that's where that rip was, and you can't even tell now. Just filled in with a little bit of orange. Just looks like there's a little, little bit of texture in the first stripe. It's okay. fix some stuff on his back here. I gotta fix that little spot of ripped paper there, but then before I do that, I'm gonna put in a little bit of shading on that orange. Just in a few spaces where the rest of his fur is in shadow. Hey, Chris. Yes, Chris, can you tell I'm a little bit like, cautiously excited about the new He-Man show? I'm 
I'm going to give it a try this week. I signed up for a Netflix account today. Oh my gosh, I keep making more of a mess here. bit of roughness on the paper there. Oh, it's I had yellow paint on my finger. I'm going to have to trim this down tighter. <laughs> or more put more yellow around it. I don't know. Um, okay. I was going to fix that green on Cringer on his tushy. Also to fix, oh, to fix the, some of the orange on his tail. And then I was going to just touch up a few lines and I'm going to call this good because I think I'm at time, right? I'm just about, I don't know if I'm going to sell this one. Maybe I'll put it up. I don't know. I'm bummed out about some of the smudges that I got on it. Ink time. Where's my ink pens? Gonna fix up that line on his back. side of his face. I think we got a cringer and an orco. Oh, 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 one more thing. One more thing. my white pen test it out first make sure it's working it is a little bit of white clean on cringer's eyes and an orcos <clears throat> well i'll you know, I'll be doing live streams weekly and I'll probably be talking about it a lot. So, and I did, I saw that there's like a lot of new lore, a lot of interesting lore um, in terms of King Grayskull and other things like that. So yeah, I'm, I'm just glad that, like I said, so far I haven't seen He-Man use his power to hurt anybody. I, he's lifted people, threw him in a thing, lifted a thing, threw it a thing, but I haven't seen him actually like go up to Beast Man and punch him in the face. I think that's that's gonna be like the line that it, like once I see that it's gonna be really hard for me to watch, but we'll see. Maybe other parts will be redeeming. I walked into Transformers Prime in 2010, going harumph. This is dark. This is violent. I'm not into that with my Transformers, and they found other ways to like scoop me in and get me really sold on what they were doing there. And part of it was the lore building that they did. So I'm I'm cautiously optimistic, and I'm looking forward to watching it this Friday. All right. Well. That's it for this week's live stream. Um, I do these Tuesdays at 1.30 Eastern, uh, 12.30 Central, 10.30 AM Pacific. And then uh, they are collected on my YouTube channel. 
at uh, youtube.com slash, what is it, C slash Jersey Droz. Just Jersey Droz on YouTube. M might be a good idea to look for Jersey Droz comics because there is a famous base manufacturer named Jersey Drozd. But uh, yes, thank you for hanging out and chatting with me while I did this. And until next time, I've been Jersey Drozd of jdrozd.com and uh, rss.jdrozd.com for everything I make. Okay, bye.